This program is brought to you by Emory University. Our speaker this morning, as you can see, is Logan Everly. Logan's one of our second year clinical track fellows. Uh, Logan, uh, originally from Louisville, right? Yeah, originally from Louisville, Rhodes College for undergrad, uh, University of Louisville for medical school, then Duke for his residency. And as you can see, he's gonna talk to us today about uh, anomalous coronary arteries, Logan. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, so yeah, um, as he said, I'm Logan Everly. I'm gonna talk about anomalous aortic origin of uh, coronary arteries today. Um, so I'm going to start off with a case. So this is a 65-year-old uh, female with hepatitis C, hypertension, uh, type 2 diabetes, and end-stage renal disease on peritoneal dialysis. She was referred to cardiology for a, a pre-operative assessment prior to consideration for a renal transplant. She doesn't really have any notable cardiac symptoms at this time. She doesn't do any formal exercise, um, but does do... Um, house chores and walks and does her daily activities without any limitations. Um, this is her resting uh, ECG, um, shows sinus rhythm with maybe some nonspecific T wave abnormalities, but otherwise um, not a whole lot to say about it. Um, she did have an echocardiogram that showed an EF of 50 to 55 percent, uh, mild AI and mild uh, LVH. Um, she then uh, underwent a pharmacologic spect that showed a small apical reversible defect. Um, so she then was referred for uh, cardiac catheterization. Um, and this is her um, coronary angiogram. So um, we were trying to engage the left coronary artery. We were unable to do so. Um, so i um, clocked over with the Tiger catheter to engage the right first. And this is then an LAO projection of what we saw. Um, as you can see, there's um, a single ostium uh, of the coronary system in the right cusp um, with a um, left coronary that then um, crosses over um, with a long left main and then um, dividing into the you know, LAD and circumflex. Um, this is it. Um, I'm going backwards now. Um, okay. So this is uh, in an LAO caudal projection again. Just let you guys look at it, but um, again, the similar similar findings. And then um, this projection um, is RAO, which I think is uh, particularly helpful because you can see that the anomalous left actually goes posteriorly as it uh, as it exits, which will have some significance that will um, be appreciated later in this talk. And then finally, just a. Uh, AP projection, so that you can see multiple views. Um, of note, you do see um, a bullet fragment in this patient, so the patient had a history of a gunshot wound in the past, but uh, that's just a, another incidental finding on this cath. <laughs> um, so my objectives for today are to examine the prevalence of uh, anomalous aortic origin of coronary arteries arising at uh, or above the inappropriate sinus of Valsalva, and we will pay uh, special attention to the interarterial uh, subtype for reasons that we will get to. Um, we will discuss the use of the various uh, diagnostic testing modalities in evaluating AAOCA, and we will review the outcomes and summarize the current management guidelines uh, for um, these patients, um, particularly again with the interarterial um, subtypes. Um, as an introduction, um, so AAOCA is defined as a congenital abnormality of the origin or course of a coronary artery that arises from the aorta. And we will be focusing on an anomalous left coronary artery off the right sinus of Valsalva and vice versa, an anomalous right coronary arising at or above the left sinus. Um, very rarely, um, anomalous coronaries can come off the quote unquote non coronary sinus. Um, these patients have a very highly uh, have a highly variable presentation, ranging from clear evidence of ischemia with angina, um, cardiac arrest, uh, VT, VF, uh, syncope, um, to patients who are um, like our patient initially in our case, uh, who are completely asymptomatic at time of diagnosis. Um, clinically, the um, the most relevant um, reason why this is worth discussing is that it is a leading cause of sudden uh, cardiac death in young athletes. So if you look at 
um, the data from the NCAA. Um, it is, uh, the, the, they actually um, think it's the leading cause of sudden death in young athletes. Um, if you look at the uh, US, uh, the data from the US National Registry of Sudden Cardiac Death, they have it as the second um, leading cause behind hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, but it is, is somewhere between um, 15 to 20% of the um, causes of sudden cardiac death in young athletes. Um, these, this condition can be further characterized by the um, course, uh, the subtypes of the course. So as you can see, there's a variety of different courses the anomalous artery can take um, as it exits the uh, sinus. So it can take a pre-pulmonic um, course where it goes anteriorly and anterior to the pulmonary artery. Uh, it can take a, um, a sub-pulmonary course where the artery dives inferiorly um, underneath the pulmonary valve. It can go retroaortic um, or posteriorly or even posteriorly all the way retrocardiac. Um, however, the one that we worry about the most is the interarterial um, subtype. Um, because as we'll discuss here in a second, that's the one that we think is associated with the highest risk of sudden death. Um, an important point here as well is that, um, especially with the interarterial subtype, there can be an intramural course um, proximally, meaning that the artery travels between the wall um, of the aorta, and, um, that, and that is actually seen in the majority of interarterial cases where there is a proximal intramural course. And, um, we'll talk about the surgical options for treatment of this condition later, but just uh, suffice to say for now that that has a, a big implication with regards to the surgical te technique, whether you can do an unroofing uh, procedure um, if there is an intramural course present versus um, if it's strictly an interarterial course, often the um, surgical choice is a reimplantation of the coronary in the appropriate sinus. Um, so these Autopsy studies are really the basis for why we think that the uh, interarterial subtype is the one that is particularly high risk. So these, all these studies um, were autopsy studies of patients who had uh, diagnosed on autopsy interarterial anomalous right or anomalous left coronary arteries. And um, as you can see, especially with the anomalous left coronaries, there was a very high percentage of these patients where they attributed the cause of death to a coronary event. Um, um, very high percentages, as you can see in many of these studies, upwards 70s, 80s, even you know, a small study with four patients, 100%. But uh, regardless, a very high percentage of these patients, that was um, what was their, uh, at least what was attributed on autopsy as their cause of death. The percentages, as you can see, are lower um, for the right coronary, although um, still uh, a wide variation, but still um, certainly some risk involved with having an interarterial anomalous right coronary. Um, the two other points I'd like everyone to um, take away from this slide are uh, that a lot of these patients died during exercise. So there seems to be um, you know, something with exercise and transient ischemia um, during exercise that is what really puts these people at risk for sudden death. And um, finally, and I think disturbing and what makes it challenging for us as uh, cardiologists is that a lot of these patients were asymptomatic <coughs> before they died. Um, you know, anywhere between, you know, around 40 to 70 percent of these patients had no symptoms whatsoever <laughs> until they had their sudden cardiac uh, death, which makes, you know, risk stratifying these patients um, very challenging. This figure is uh, just to show you guys in more um, kind of graphic detail. Um, the difference between some of the subtypes. So on the left side uh, of your screen is um, ab above is a 3D uh, representation and below is um, just the CT scan of um, someone with an interarterial subtype. So you can see that there is a um, anomalous left coronary coming off the right cusp but then travels um, between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And then on the uh, right side you see um, an anomalous left uh, uh, coronary that then in, uh, goes and in, dives inferiorly and goes underneath the, the pulmonary valve. Um, so this um, slide is a, f a forest plot of many studies that have looked to try to identify what is the real actual prevalence of this disease. So. Um, this uh, is a force plot of anomalous coronaries of all subtypes. So 
um, as you can see, there's very wide um, um, kind of variation as to what the prevalence was based on um, the studies and particularly based on the different imaging modalities that were used for diagnosis, whether it be um, invasive coronary angiography, echo, CTA, MRA. Um, I think, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that's important is that these studies are going to be biased on the true prevalence because all of these patients would have had indication for these tests, right? So these are not asymptomatic patients for the most part. These are patients that either had symptoms or had some reason why they got an invasive angiogram or a CTA, et cetera. So due to that, we still really don't know with absolute confidence what the true prevalence of this disease is. This is essentially a similar figure, but looking specifically at the interarterial subtypes. So again, there's a wide variation for the same reasons I just discussed, but um, I think the take home point is that interarterial uh, left coronary is rare relative to interarterial um, right coronary. Um, you know, the estimated uh, prevalence of the anomalous uh, left coronary is, is based on this around 0.03%, so quite rare. And anomalous inner arterial anomalous right coronary, also rare, but more prevalent around 0.25%. Um, I would like to take some time now to review uh, the different diagnostic testing modalities for this condition. So often, um, echocardiography is a test that a lot of these patients will get. Um, it's not invasive, rapid, low cost, widely available. Unfortunately, um, TTE has uh, very limited uh, accuracy to detect this condition. Um, uh, it's estimated that the RCA um, ostium could not be identified in about 20% of young athletes on TTE. Um, that was based on a a uh, study in Italy in the 1990s where they actually, they did a screening study. So they took thir around 1,300 um, young competitive athletes um, and echoed all of them, specifically, you know, using protocols to look for anomalous coronary arteries. And um, in that study, um, in 20% of the patients, they could not identify the ostium of the right coronary. And I think that's also particularly important because this is a patient population that you would expect high quality echo images, uh, young, um, healthy, fit young people. Um, TEE um, is used primarily perioperatively if these patients are going for surgery, and, um, but it is not part of you know, the routine evaluation um, of this condition because we have other better non-invasive uh, techniques. Uh, so this is... Uh, an echo uh, where you actually can see an interarterial uh, left coronary. Um, so this is you know short axis. Uh, you see the aorta and the RVOT, and um, you can see the arrows directing you to um, uh, the anomalous coronary, the left main, where the three small um, uh, arrows are running in between the aorta and the RVOT, and then it, you see it bifurcating into the LAD and the and the circumflex. However, coronary CTA and MRA have really become the standard and best initial test to diagnose this condition. Um, in many centers, including uh, here at Emory, um, for the most part, uh, CTA is preferred, and that's for several reasons. One um, is there's very rapid, uh, it has rapid scan times compared to MRA, and um, that's even, that's particularly um, important to note in, you know, pediatric population where uh, you know, MRI, long scan times have to sit still. Um, in pediatric patients, often they have to be sedated for MRIs. Um, so whereas CT scan, often we can get by without that. So the rapid scan time is a, is a you know, significant benefit. It actually offers better spatial resolution than MRI does. It costs less. It can diagnose uh, simultaneously if there's any obstructive coronary atherosclerosis. And um, it can further characterize other features of the anomalous coronary that we'll um, discuss here on the next slide. But um, the one thing I'll say about MRA and CT um, as a comparison is, you know, this is somewhat center dependent. I imagine, you know, there are some centers where they have a lot of expertise in MRA, and um, so they do that as well. Um, the other benefit of MRA is that if you do want to do functional testing, which a lot of these patients ultimately get some sort of functional test that with MRA you can do... Uh, with MRI, you can do simultaneous functional testing at the same time that you're doing an anatomic evaluation. Um, 
So this slide shows uh, the different things that you can, different aspects of an anomalous coronary that you can evaluate well on CT. And um, these um, aspects or qualities of the lesion are important for both risk assessment as well as surgical planning. Um, so you can see, you know, what the ostium looks like. Is it a common ostium um, off the same cusp, or do they come off the same cusp but have separate ostiums where are the proximal branch vessels, et cetera? If there is an area of uh, um, narrowing, you can see that. So, you know, we think that this slit-like ostium that you see on the right of, uh, of B, um, um, figure B, that that seems to be, a, we think that is a higher risk lesion um, for compression and ischemia and sudden death. Furthermore, if you find an area of narrowing, you can see exactly how long it is. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the importance of identifying the intramural segment. Um, so you can, very, you can see here on CT whether there is the, an intramural segment or not and how long it is as well as the uh, angle takeoff, whether there's an you know, acute or non-acute takeoff. And then finally, for, um, especially for surgical planning, knowing where the takeoff of the coronary is important um, because the surgeon has to be mindful not to damage the commissure of the aortic apparatus during surgery, so knowing exactly where these coronaries take off is important for them to know. With regards to invasive angiography, you know, it is there, it certainly has some advantages. It's generally, um, although, you know, a little, although invasive is generally a low risk thing um, and offers very excellent spatial and temporal resolution. Um, although I think it does important to, to point out some of its limitations. So um, there is a significant failure in um, diagnosing these patients. So there was a registry um, in, done a registry study done in Spain in 2006 where they um, looked at 13 different hospitals, reviewed over 20,000 uh, coronary angiograms, and um, they found, they identified anomalous coronaries eventually in 98 patients. Um, but when they looked back, you know, 40 of them, so around 40 percent of the patients, they actually um, did not make that diagnosis on their invasive angiogram. So they would, you know, the, what typically happened was they would be, these patients were referred for cath, they were unable to engage the coronaries, and so they ended up getting a CT afterwards, and then that's what made the diagnosis of the uh, anomalous coronary. So they, um, so it can, you know, miss this condition or at least not identify the characteristics of it if you're unable to engage the anomalous coronary. Um, and then, in addition to that, even if you make the diagnosis invasively, a lot of these patients end up getting a CT scan afterwards. Um, this, there's a 2017 uh, study where they reviewed 103 cases of anomalous coronaries um, and that were all detected initially on invasive angiography, and 45, so around 40, you know, 44 percent of these patients ended up getting CT, uh, CTA after their invasive angiogram. And you can imagine, for all the reasons we discussed on the previous slide, why that might be the case. Um, better outline the anatomy, the surrounding structures, uh, et cetera. What, you know, in, in the technology that's gotten some people um, interested in um, with this condition is IVUS, um, or intravascular ultrasound. And the reason for this is that this is the, a test that you can do um, throughout the cardiac cycle. So you can um, put, you know, an IVUS uh, catheter uh, in the artery, in the cath lab, and you can measure uh, the, the vessel diameter uh, dynamically, especially during diastole, which is when the coronaries uh, primarily are filling. Um, and then in addition, you can see if there's a systolic compression of the artery um, during, during the case. Um, the, it does come with, with drawbacks, so as we mentioned earlier, these vessels can be hard to engage. Um, also, you know, when you're putting catheters into uh, coronaries, you can always cause spasm, and so sometimes it's not easy to tell whether you've caused spasm or whether this is a true narrowing of an anomalous artery. And then there is a concern um, that actually just doing the IVUS and putting the catheter in can cause uh, ischemia. So there was a 2007 retrospective review where it was a very small sample size. There was only 31 patients, but it was 31 patients who had anomalous coronaries who all had IVUS, and three of those patients, so 
um, developed uh, ischemia during the, the procedure and either had to have uh, just the catheter removed so they weren't able to really get the information that they needed or even there was one patient who actually needed um, developed refractory, probably spasm and ischemia and actually had a stent placed uh, during their procedure. Um, and finally, uh, OCT, uh, similar to IVUS, may also have a role, although it hasn't really been studied at all. Um, this is primarily a reference slide that just summarizes everything that um, I've just talked about that goes over the strengths and limitations of uh, the different um, imaging uh, modalities. And I, you know, I kind of like it because you can sort of see the same uh, lesions um, in all these different modalities here. Um, now, what about the role for non-invasive functional testing? Um, because as I mentioned earlier, the majority of these patients who have sudden death die during exercise. And so naturally people have proposed, well, um, we can risk stratify these patients by having them get on the treadmill um, and exercising them and um, potentially be uh, reassured with a normal, a normal exercise stress test. However, that hasn't, unfortunately, has not turned really uh, turned out to be the case. Um, uh, ETT and stress MPI yield <coughs> both false positives and false negatives. Um, there was a review uh, published in 2000 where they looked back at 27 patients who died suddenly from and ultimately on autopsy, their death was attributed to anomalous coronaries. And when they looked back, six of those patients had actually, you know, they knew their diagnosis, they had had a stress test, uh, an exercise stress test. Um, and they had normal ETTs and had sudden death after their normal ETT. So um, based on that data, unfortunately, the absence of ischemia um, during an exercise stress test we cannot view as reassuring. Um, moving on to discuss sudden cardiac death uh, in particular, as I mentioned earlier, the autopsy studies uh, show that or indicate or suggest that interarterial anomalous left and right coronaries are associated with the higher risk of sudden cardiac death. Um, the, when you look back at the subgroups of these patients, the highest risk appears to be in young people um, and people with interarterial left coronary um, artery in particular. And as I mentioned, most of the deaths occurred during exercise. However, a lot of the patients didn't have symptoms before their sudden cardiac uh, death event. So as a result, that's led some to propose screening uh, strategies. Since so many of these people were asymptomatic before they died, people have, you know, pro have tried and proposed different screening um, programs to try to identify these people before they, before they have their sudden cardiac death. Um, un you know, unfortunately, it hasn't really proven to be uh, an effective tool. Um, Primarily because the incidence of sudden death from anomalous coronaries, when you take it, uh, look at a large cohort of healthy, asymptomatic uh, young athletes, is exceedingly rare. Um, and as a result, the current guidelines do not suggest a screening um, for these patients. And here's the data that kind of supports that. So that, you know, there's several different studies with trying to implement screening programs. And even if you take the most, the study that had the most prevalent uh, um, results, you know, the study in Italy where they screened young people, they, you know, screened, you know, uh, 4 million um, people, you would have to screen, if you believe, based on their data, you would have to screen 208,000 people to prevent one death attributed to an anomalous coronary. And that, and, you know, that would be the most, um, and it was, the prevalence was even less in some of these other studies. So. As you can imagine, given the low sensitivity of echo for diagnosing this condition, um, that would mean doing coronary CTAs or MRAs in a lot of people to prevent a single death, so it's not really a cost-effective strategy. Um, I'd like to now spend some time reviewing the outcomes um, of, of this uh, condition. Um, and I think from the review of the literature, these two statements are likely true, that the incidence of uh, AAOCA related death um, in patients who we followed is, is actually rare. However, there is also literature to support that surgical repair is safe and effective, um, especially in, re in um, relieving sim symptoms in symptomatic patients. Um, so this study I found interesting because it was one of the few studies I could find 
if not the only study, where there is a primary conservative approach to this condition. So this, it's an you know, older study conducted in the 90s and only in Japan, but they reviewed 56 patients with anomalous coronaries, um, 44 of whom, so most of these actually did have an interarterial, albeit interarterial anomalous right coronary. I think it is important to know that none of these patients had an interarterial left coronary. The other, you know, tw excuse me, 12 patients had um, either, you know, they had non-interarterial lesions essentially. Um, also, these were old, these were adult patients, these were older patients, the mean age was 55, but all of these patients were managed conservatively. None of them underwent surgery, and at a little bit over five years of follow-up, there were no, uh, no sudden cardiac death uh, events in these patients. Now, alternatively, there's also literature that says that operating on these patients is safe and effective. So this is a study published in 2014 um, in, Euro in the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery. Um, where uh, the authors looked at 76 patients at a single center um, over about a 15-year period who underwent a surgical repair for an anomalous coronary. Um, these, this, of note, this was more of a pediatric population. The median age was 15. Um, and 41 of the 76 patients um, in the study had preoperative symptoms. Uh, with regards to the surgical technique, the unroofing procedure was by far the most common. It was done in 55 of the patients with reimplantation done in seven and pulmonary artery translocation done in 14. Um, and then when they reviewed these patients at a median follow-up of six years, there was no early or uh, late mortality in any of these patients. I think it is important to know there was one of the 76 patients who post-operatively, you know, it was actually he had, the patient had gone home and was recovering, but then uh, subsequently developed, redeveloped ischemia and actually ultimately got a heart transplant. Um, although the remaining um, 75 <laughs> patients were all symptom-free at follow-up. So, you know, the, you know, that was 41 patients who had preoperative symptoms, got surgery. None, no one other than the one patient developed any symptoms post-op. So this study, you know, the authors would say that this showed that surgical repair is a safe and effective strategy. Um, now, we've reviewed a primary conservative strategy where all the patients were managed conservatively, and we reviewed a strategy that was solely surgical, but what about a comparison of the two? Um, so probably the most robust data um, is from this paper published in 2011 out of the Cleveland Clinic. Um, they reviewed uh, over 200,000 um, patients who underwent a, a cardiac catheterization um, from essentially when they started doing cath in the 1960s up until 2007. Um, and they ultimately identified 301 patients who had a confirmed anomalous coronary, um, and 54 had an interarterial course. So when they looked at, um, retrospectively, all, of all the people, if you took all comers with anomalous coronaries, there was similar all-cause uh, mortality, whether these patients had surgery or no surgery. Um, however, if you looked at the patients with the interarterial course, there was a trend toward a lower all-cause mortality with surgery, um, although this study was not powered for that, and so the, there was not a, it was a trend, not a statistically significant p-value. And I think the other interesting points that I took away from reading this paper is that there was no difference in mortality between those with or without an interarterial course. However, surgery was twice as likely to, uh, to have occurred in um, patients with an interarterial course. So it does at least make you wonder that the reason for potentially no difference in mortality is that the people with the higher risk lesions were operated on. Now I'd like to discuss the management. Um, so I think an important point um, before we start talking about um, guidelines is that patients who have anomalous coronaries without an interarterial course and are and who are asymptomatic have a good prognosis and likely do not require um, any other intervention. Um, however, as we've discussed, the interarterial course patients do seem to be at higher risk. So here, this here, uh, we're gonna review the guidelines from the 2018 ACC uh, AHA guidelines for adults with congenital heart disease. Um, the recommendations for diagnostic testing are kind of uh, delightfully vague. Um, it, there's a class one recommendation for um, essentially uh, 
uh, diagnostic evaluation with either CAT, CT, or MR is, recommendation for, is recommended for evaluation of anomalous coronary artery. And then my favorite is the second one, um, that anatomic and physiologic evaluation should be performed in patients with anomalous aortic origin of a, a left coronary from the right sinus or vice versa. Um, so they don't, they say that you should evaluate, they don't particularly give you much guidance on how to. Um, the therapeutic um, guidelines are a little bit more um, definitive. Um, so there's a class one recommendation for surgery in patients with anomalous coronaries who have um, symptoms or evidence of ischemia based on imaging or, um, or stress testing. Um, then there's a 2A recommendation for patients who have an anomalous left coronary um, off the right cusp, even in the absence of symptoms or ischemia, that um, it's reasonable to operate on these patients. Um, some, there's also a, a recommendation, a 2A recommendation for um, anomalous coronaries in the setting of ventricular arrhythmias. And then the uh, 2B recommendation, this last one here, is that surgery or observation is reasonable in asymptomatic patients with either anomalous left or right coronaries um, who do not have ischemia or high risk uh, anatomic lesions, such as uh, acute angle takeoff um, and uh, narrow takeoff and intramural course, uh, et cetera. So this is uh, also published in the guidelines and this sort of goes through um, the guidelines that we just uh, looked at in uh, flow chart form. So as you can see, if you have an anomalous uh, aortic origin of a coronary artery and you have left from the right, if you have any symptoms or ischemia during diagnostic testing, you get a class one recommendation for surgery. Um, and if you do not, it's still a class 2A. If you have a right coronary from the left sinus um, and you have symptoms, again, it's class 1. If you don't, um, and you, but if you ha ever had ventricular arrhythmias, then you get a 2A. And if you did not, then you get a 2B to where it's reasonable to either consider continued observation versus um, surgery. Another point that I wanted to touch on with regards to the management recommendations is about exercise restriction, because a lot of these patients who get diagnosed with this condition are um, competitive uh, athletes, and um, there's a, you know, a lot of psychosocial as well as uh, um, health uh, problems that can arise from, health, from exercise restricting people, so you, um, you really need to do that um, with some caution, so our, the guidelines from 2015, um, from the ACCHA uh, scientific statement, state that um, all patients with an anomalous right coronary should have a stress test. Um, and if they have a negative stress test, they say um, it's reasonable to allow them to, to, to return to competitive sports after adequate counseling. Um, that the, uh, you know, it's talking about the uncertainty of a, uh, of a negative stress test. And, um, they do say, though, that if they're going to go undergo, if they're an anomalous right coronary about to undergo a surgical repair, that you should restrict them um, before their surgery or certainly if they had any ischemia um, or arrhythmias um, on stress testing. Um, with regards to the left coronary, they're a little bit more uh, restrictive. So if someone has an anomalous left coronary, they say that they should, not, they should be restricted from all competitive sports, possibly with the exception of 1A sports, which are things like yoga and golf and things of relatively low activity. Archery, <laughs> Archery yes. <laughs> um, and then with regards to post-operative, you know, so these, if these patients do get operated on, they'll, you know, they would certainly ask, like, when can I start playing sports again? Um, the recommendations is that um, athletes uh, can consider participation in, um, in all sports three months post-operatively if they have a post-operative, if they remain symptom-free and have a post-operative stress test that shows no ischemia or does not bring on any symptoms. Um, a full detailed discussion of the surgical repair in these patients is a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, but I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about it to highlight some of the key points. And I think probably the biggest take home point is that um, bypass grafting should be avoided um, unless there's um, concomitant uh, coronary atherosclerosis in the anomalous vessel. And the reason for that, as you can imagine, is that um, there's a very high rate of graft failure in these patients um, due to competitive flow from their native vessel. 
generally, if the patient has a long intramural course of their anomalous coronary, unroofing is the preferred procedure. Um, if there's not a long, um, an intramural course, often coronary reimplantation or um, sometimes pulmonary artery translocation, kind of moving it out of the way so that there's less compression on the interarterial segment are also options. And the surgeon has to be careful to avoid damage to the aortic valve apparatus during surgery. Briefly did want to discuss PCI because people have, um, have looked into this as a possible treatment for this condition. Um, but there is limited evidence and really none that supports the use of PCI in these patients. Um, there was a review or a study that looked at 42 patients, um, average age around 50, with, who had interarterial uh, right coronaries who actually got stented. Um, and they had a, around a 15% rate of, in, of uh, instant restenosis by serial IVUS. And 30% um, of those patients developed um, recurrent symptoms at a medium follow-up of five years. So um, this was one of the few studies looking at PCI in this population, but I think based on it, you know, we certainly could not recommend this as a routine uh, treatment for these patients. So I'd now like to just summarize the take-home points from the talk that I hope that you guys come away with. Um, the true prevalence of this, uh, of this disease is unknown, um, although it is rare, um, but interarterial ARCA is more common than an in, than a, a anomalous left coronary. Uh, CT, MRA, and invasive angiography are, primary, are the preferred diagnostic tests. Um, the risk of sudden cardiac death is highest in young people and in those with interarterial left coronary, anomalous left coronary artery. The absence of uh, ischemia during a stress test cannot be viewed as uh, reassuring and um, should, counsel should not be, uh, patients should not be counseled that this, that this is uh, reassuring. Um, sur and then lastly, surgery is recommended certainly for anyone with a concerning history, uh, such as an aborted sudden cardiac death, ventricular arrhythmia, syncope, uh, angina, um, or any abnormalities on stress testing. Um, and can, can be considered for high-risk lesions and even in the absence of symptoms, and that uh, uh, cabbage should certainly be avoided as the surgical technique for these patients. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Drs. Uh, Jokadar and Smith who helped uh, me in the preparation for this talk and reviewing my slides. Um, and this is my references, and um, thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions. How do we find them? How do we find them? <laughs> How do we find them? Well, we left that out, right? <laughs> well, I mean, that's obviously <laughs> that's obviously the huge challenge, right? So they they're generally found based on symptoms, you know. So someone is having symptoms that ultimately leads to a coronary angiogram, and then they're found. So, so like a teenager. Teenager or a 20-year-old or 30-year-old or whatever, uh, they're out there. I'm not sure we know how to find them because they obviously are dropping dead on the football field. And uh, that gets into the question, of course, of uh, how do we screen our mm -hmm. student athletes or whatever. Yeah, I mean, They don't come to the emergency room with chest pain too often with our right. anomalous coronary. Well, and that's, I mean, the it's, answer is we, do, we don't, question to answer. Yeah, we don't really know, right? Because we've shown that screening uh, large asymptomatic populations is not cost effective um, in a lot of these, but a lot of these patients don't have symptoms. So they're really, it's a, it's a huge problem. We don't have any great answers right now. I mean, I, I don't know if the study has been done, but I would dare say that the majority of these patients are probably found incident, are probably found incidentally. Mm -hmm. um, particularly the non, you know, pathologic uh, variants of it. Um, I guess, my, but my question would be for the asymptomatic patient with either, with the intraarterial variant, what would be your, rec that it is not a um, competitive athlete, and maybe this is found uh, incidentally by a CT of the chest or something along that line. What would be your recommendations for, and they're, they're very clear recommendations in terms of competitive sports, but just for exercise and activity. In an asymptomatic, maybe, you know, intraarterial left or right, 
They ask you about, well, can I exercise? Can I, can I, can I jog? Sort yeah, of thing. Exactly. You know, I think what most people would do is they would do a stress test. Um, and if it was, uh, you know, positive, of course, they would address that. And if it was negative, then I think most people would, you know, I think maybe Dr. Our congenital folks could uh, could answer that question, but I think um, most people would then I would just counsel my patient, being saying, you know, you have this lesion, but you you're let's say they're 55 years old and they've gotten through their whole life without any symptoms and any problems from it, that um, it's probably okay. But if you just if you adequately counsel them, that we don't know for sure, but um, that's probably what I would tell them that they could do routine, you know, regular exercise, but just not high competitive uh, sports is probably what I would say. I have a patient that uh, in 2011, we noted that his LAD was traversing from the right side and going anteriorly. So Dr. Guyton did a lemur to his LAD. <coughs> he loves to exercise. Uh, he was in the Coast Guard, now he's retired. I recently saw him, 55 years old now, and did a stress test and dramatic ST depression in the inferior leaf. So I send him for a nuclear. The nuclear report comes back that there's no coronary ischemia, but there is TID. So I said, <laughs> okay, where do I go from there? So I did, I've ordered a CTA on him, and I'm now waiting for him to get a CTA. And I'm, I'm not sure why in the infield, and he's asymptomatic, and he exercises vigorously every day. Uh, any suggestions what to do with this guy? <laughs> Lima's uh, down. Uh, and he's, he's post-operative, so he had a, a, a re-implantation. Is, is that was the surgery he had? Um, mm. So his lima, yeah, so he, if he had a lima, I mean, his, his, he probably has an atretic lima, right? And so now he's back to probably where he was before surgery. Um, so it's a challenging situation. But this is someone that maybe you consider, if he's a reasonable surgical candidate, that you talk about doing an alternative surgery again on him. If he's, I mean, he has ECG evidence of ischemia, right? So I think it would be hard to continue to let him exercise. I'd feel that would keep me up at night, I think. But I don't know, maybe you guys can comment as well. <laughs> These situations are really hard. If you want to start an argument, I don't want to say argument, a lively discussion <laughs> in our conference, in our congenital conference, you bring up one of these coronary anomaly cases. We each have different opinions. The data are just not there. Um, different, each of us have different uh, thresholds. But let me give you an approach. It may not be the right approach, but let me give you sort of my approach. If there's an intramural course, I don't care where, which artery, very low threshold to unroof. Do you mind pulling up the, 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 the slide where unroof? The, the, the different ana uh, anatomic segments where you, very nice slide. So coronary unroofing is a source of confusion. I know the, um, the CT scans. Oh, the, the CTs. CTs. So let me give you an example of this. So last year I saw a patient who had an NSTEMI. He had a, a he had a, I think it was a right off the left with an intramural segment, but he also had a coronary bridge. And his surgery was two separate unroofing operations. So there's unroofing of the coronary. Here, let me come up here and show you. This segment is excised by an erototomy. See this intramural segment, okay? This slit light segment. The surgeon performs an erototomy above and removes this segment. Thereby, the ostium, instead of coming from here, it's up here now. So that is unroofing an intramural segment of a coronary. What about a bridge? A bridge is when it dives in the myocardium and you remove the surface of the myocardium. So those are two separate, two separate coronary uh, uh, unroofing operations that are often conflated, uh, particularly by our learners. So that's an important, that's an important distinction to make. Um, so, so my approach, like I said, if there is an intramural segment because it's such a relatively straightforward operation in, in, the, uh, in the correct hands, uh, you know, my threshold to unroof that is, uh, is very small. When it's not an intramural segment, it gets to be a little bit more complicated unless 
it is a uh, left off the right. So left off the right uh, uh, that is not intramural, then, then uh, that's a r relatively more straightforward. Uh, right off the left are almost always intramural, almost always, with very rare exceptions. So that is my sort of general approach. Um, the other thing is, uh, as you point out, bypass should be avoided. Mm -hmm. If bypass is absolutely necessary, then the coronary should be ligated to avoid these competitive flow problem. Um, but you, you did a fantastic job with this presentation. Thank you. I think, Mon, you gave me the answer. I'm going to send it to your clinic. <laughs> <laughs> so so what, did, what did you do with our transplant candidate? Does, she, does, she, does that increase her risk for surgery? Or yeah, no? so good, good question. So. Um, looking, I, I'm sending her for CTA, um, but looking at her angiogram, I think she has a non interarterial segment. Um, if you looked at her um, on her, um, let me pull it up, on her RAO uh, shot, I'm going the wrong way. Um, it looks like the, R, the um, left coronary goes uh, posteriorly. Um, meaning, you know, so it's kind of, it's probably a retro a aortic course as opposed to going bet anteriorly between the PA and the aorta. It's probably going um, the other way. So, yeah, the RAO. So you can see it's kind of, it's, you know, you're looking at the heart from, the, you know, this way. It's probably going around the aorta posteriorly. Um, is what I think and what we thought at the time. Um, so we, we are getting a CTA to just confirm everything, but ultimately I don't think it puts this patient, uh, pr precludes her, uh, if that all checks out from getting her kidney. The other, the other point is, and you've made this point already, is with cath, it's very easy to miss an initial <coughs> intramural segment. And you can have an intraarterial with an initial intramural segment. In fact, most of them, as you point out, have an initial intramural segment and with cath it's very easy to miss that slit like orifice uh, which like I said uh, that's what we unroof Rem remind me where her um, ischemia was shown on, on <laughs> she had like a five percent apical defect so it's probably nothing <laughs> honestly so I guess um, one thing to point out that hasn't been uh, explicitly said but not in but you've implicitly said it is that the concern for an interarterial course is because of uh, during exercise, there are changes to the size of the aorta, um, as well as the pulmonary artery. And the thought is that the compression of the coronary, regardless of which sinus it's coming from, if it has an intraarterial course or an interarterial course, and there is a difference, that's why I'm saying those two, um, is that. Um, with exercise, if you have expansion of the great vessels, then you do have transient ischemia, which is thought to be the, the cause of sudden cardiac death. You'll notice that in the guidelines, regardless, a left from the right um, gets operated on um, with the thinking that the LAD covers more territory and therefore is at more at risk. Um, whereas a right from the left, the only time that you observe is if they don't have any evidence of ischemia on functional tests or symptoms of ischemia and no history of arrhythmias. And the thinking behind that is because of the <clears throat> microvascular dysfunction and the small scars that develop um, more distally. And so it's not just transient ischemia in the setting of exercise and coronary compression, but it's actually microvascular dysfunction leading to areas of, of scar tissue um, further distally that are anitis for those ventricular arrhythmias, which then be um, the cause or the attributing cause of, of sudden cardiac death. The reason why I say intraarterial and intraarterial is that some people will say intramural and intraarterial simultaneously or interchangeably. And so it's just important when you're going through the literature that you do understand um, the, the rationale for that. that Logan, do we know any of uh, the genetic basis of this, or is there any recommendations for screening of families? It's a good question. I did not, when I was looking at the literature, I could not find any evidence for that, but um, so not to my knowledge. Um, I don't know for you guys, but yeah. They're commonly associated with congenital heart disease. 10% of pathological locations have a coronary anomaly, but um, 
I don't know of other genetic abnormalities. Just by way of, you know, we talked about athletes. Pistol Pete Maravich mm -hmm. had a giant right artery, no left vein, and uh, and he played full career in basketball. Died, I think, in his early 40s in a pickup game, mm -hmm. uh, and his autopsy showed signs of chronic ischemia and fibrosis in his heart, which was which was fascinating. We've seen several athletes, and uh, there's a bullet fragment there. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we, we've seen we've seen several uh, se several athletes, uh, uh, and including one professional basketball player, who we ended up uh, unroofing the right off the left. We did a stress test before that was negative, <laughs> but it did not, you know, dissuade us from uh, doing this operation. And then we did the operation, and three months after, we did another stress test that was again reassuringly negative, and he went back to playing professional. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.